Hello, and welcome to the Alexander Society. It's a podcast where we drink and we talk about history. It's a real hoot, let me tell you. It's also a podcast where we just spill our freshly opened beer all over a computer desk and just barely miss our nice, fancy, expensive keyboard. Oh, you got a nice keyboard now? Yeah, when I got this computer, uh, my dad got me like this super nice, like, gamer light light up like mechanical keyboard i didn't know that i didn't i didn't pay attention to your keyboard in the video and the picture you sent me i hadn't well i i hadn't been using it for a while because the space bar kept double tapping uh and it got annoying so i just used like the the shitty stock keyboard that came with the computer but i recently pulled it out again to see if i could figure it out and i just like lowered the uh the sensitivity or like the the refresh rate for the for the tap can like frequency on the keyboard that sounds like an optical keyboard uh they're still kind of mechanical but they're not really the same kind of mechanical. okay well, i don't know the difference all i know is that i can pop these things off and put them back on no problem the keycaps yeah almost all keyboards that aren't like uh um like you know the lap tiles laptop style can pop off keycaps well yeah but i always find a way to fuck it up <laughs> true so derek what are you drinking tonight what am i drinking tonight so for my drinks for my birthday last year i got an advent calendar from my aunt except it was it was like a german beer advent calendar so every every day of december leading up to christmas i opened it up and got a different german import beer okay and one of my one of my favorite beers from that advent calendar was a brand called leinenkugel and while i was in the liquor store getting drinks today i found some leinenkugel so you're like hell yeah hell yeah so i got some leinenkugel berry weiss which is like a it's just a light beer with like a blackberry uh like hints of blackberry in it. Okay. And for my shots, I got this stuff is so good. I had a sip when I got home today. It's called Blue Chair Bay. Uh it's a pineapple rum cream. Interesting. Which I'm sure isn't meant for shooting. I'm sure it's meant for cocktails, but it's too good not to shoot. It it's oh my god. Just just imagine like pineapple and cream. I bet it's delicious. It's li- it's it is liquid pineapple with cream that gets you drunk. It is so so good. All right. And tonight I am going back to my fan favorite prairie, but this time they have a watermelon sour and it's called Watermelon Girlfriend. Ooh. And I'm going to try and finish off this bottle of Cimarron tequila. I tried one of those uh sours when we did the the booze swap. Um, I tried one of those. Uh... I didn't send any sour. Oh no! Yes, I did. I sent the I sent the one from our last episode. Yeah, I think so. Um, but that one was really good. I really enjoyed that one. <laughs> <laughs> didn't see yourself as a sour guy. No, I didn't. But it was it was like vaguely fruity. But it was like it it was I don't know. It was just good. It was just good. Yeah. I don't I believe you. Just been trying to get bad sours. I think you Derek. just enjoy. I think you're a masochist <laughs> who hates uh, good, good tasting stuff. And so, when you actually get something that tastes good, it's like uh, it's like kryptonite for you. Anyways, we have a series of rules here in our illustrious organization. Rule number one: we take a shot at the start of the episode. So, cheers. Yeah. Oh, it's like, it's like dessert. Oh man, this stuff is going to make me an alcoholic. Again. Again, yeah. So my lips have not been doing good, so that stung really bad for me on that tequila. Ooh, oh no, that's not good. I'll live. (laughs) Tim, what's rule number two? Rule number two, if there's an event in our story where someone dies, we take a sip. Rule number three, if we mention someone who was in a previous episode, we take a sip. If alcohol is mentioned in our story, we take a sip. If there's an event in the story where someone dies and alcohol is involved, we take a shot. So, let's see. You ready to get started? Yeah. Uh, Give me a brief reminder of where we were at. Yeah. When we left off, the Supreme Court of the Colony of New York had just ruled that the settlers of the New Hampshire grants were squatting on New York land, and the outraged settlers of the grants had started taking matters into their own hands in order to defend their homes. We just started like a little like light guerrilla war in the New Hampshire grants. While war was breaking out along the border of the grants and on the border between the grants and New York, 
Tension was rising all throughout the colonies, especially in Massachusetts. After the repeal of the Stamp Acts in 1766, Parliament felt the need to emphasize and reaffirm its sovereignty over the colonies. Though they had repealed the Stamp Acts out of economic necessity, almost at the same time they passed what was called the Declaratory Act, which, of course, declared that Parliament had abs- absolute authority to pass laws in any area of the empire under any circumstances. So basically that was their response to the idea of no taxation without representation. Like, we don't care if you have representation or not, you're going to follow our laws. Get fucked is basically what they said. Yeah, get fucked. Um, In 1767 and 1768, they passed a series of new taxes on imports to the colonies, especially sugar and tea, which were called the Townsend Acts. Named after, I think it was the guy who wrote the bill, or... Yeah, I think uh, you said Henry Townsend or something like that? I don't think I gave the guy's name, and he's not important. He's just some... I could have sworn you gave the name. No, no, because he's not important at all. He's just some rich asshole in London. Uh, Anyways, this, combined with the increasing presence of redcoats stationed in American cities, especially in Boston caused renewed resentment that was slowly stewing until it exploded into murder. One cold and icy night in Boston, March 5th, 1770, an 18-year-old British sentry was standing at his post outside the customs house near the waterfront. A young boy came up to him and began to harass the soldier. The young boy was soon joined by a growing crowd of angry townspeople. When the boy got a little too close to the soldier, the soldier knocked him to the ground with the butt of his musket. The crowd became enraged and began chanting, kill him, kill him. So right off the bat, pretty, pretty good, pretty normal situation, right? Just nothing going wrong. It seems like it'll work out fine, right? Sure. Let's go with that. Hearing the commotion, some more redcoats came out and backed up the sentry. Uh, They backed up to the custom house steps and they formed a firing line with their bayonets fixed and their muzzles aimed towards the crowd. The angry Bostonians began to pelt the soldiers with snowballs, chunks of ice, and oyster shells for some reason, because they just had those laying around, and they started threatening the soldiers with swords and clubs. The commanding officer of the Redcoats may or may not have given the command to fire. We don't know for sure. But the line of soldiers did fire a single volley into the crowd, killing five people. That's a sip. This event, which came to be called the Boston Massacre, is that that one that the the Boston Massacre wasn't that uh like wasn't there like a famous painting or something over that? Yeah, there was a really famous uh, uh like wood print that was actually drawn and uh, published by Samuel Adams, and that's where we got the name Boston Massacre. It's the uh, it's the the like the wood print of the line of redcoats on the left firing into a crowd. Um, it was in all of our history books. It's like what a yeah. I, I remember distinctly. There was like a picture or something about it. Like I'm sure it was a picture. That's one of those visit, vivid things you remember from the history textbooks. It really painted the British as like evil in my class. Like that's yeah, yeah. And that was the intention because it was drawn and published by Samuel Adams, who was was it Samuel Adams? It might have been Paul Revere. I can't remember for sure. Um, but it was published by one of the early uh one of the early members of the Sons of Liberty and it was uh it was circulated all throughout the colonies and caused enormous outrage just everywhere it almost caused the revolution to erupt 5 years early oh wow i didn't know that yeah it was it was really bad if it had not been for the fact that the soldiers involved were arrested and put on trial uh for murder it would have probably resulted in large-scale revolts all throughout the colonies um which that's an interesting story on its own um the uh the the british soldiers who carried out the boston massacre were actually defended in court by uh john adams who would later go on to sign the declaration of independence and became our the second president of the united states um even though he was a an early patriot and sympathizer for rebellion against britain uh, he believed in the rule of law above all things, and so he he agreed to give the uh, British soldiers a proper defense in court because nobody else in Boston would. 
because nobody wanted to touch that with a 10 foot pole. Can you blame them? Yeah, he was probably the only person who could do it, who could actually defend them safely because his cousin was Samuel Adams, who is the leader of the Boston Sons of Liberty. So he had a little bit of protection there from the people who would want to do mob violence on him. So uh, the case uh, went through a couple, um, all of the, John Adams was a really good lawyer. Uh, He successfully defended all of the soldiers involved in the Boston massacre. None of them were found guilty for murder. Two of them were found guilty for manslaughter. They didn't face any jail time. All that happened was they got a brand. uh, They got branded on their thumbs and sent back to discharge from the army and sent back to England. You know, that kind of surprised me. I didn't know there was nuance in the law enough to have a manslaughter charge back then. I usually kind of thought, okay, they either justified it by like whatever means were like justifiable back then, or they charged you with killing someone whatever they called it. Yeah, there, there was, there wasn't a lot of consistency in the way it was applied, but they did have like a basic understanding that a premeditated murder is morally worse than an accidental killing. So fair. um, So yeah, as Boston bade for blood for these soldiers, blood, the green mountain settlers were preparing for war themselves. The attempted eviction of James Breckenridge that I mentioned at the end of the last episode had prompted the settlers to organize committees of safety, which were just like pseudo like civilian military organizations that uh, they weren't the ones picking up the guns. They were the ones organizing the ones who were picking up the guns. So the people who organized the militia basically is what a committee of safety was. So the prominent community leaders of each town appointed a captain, which would command their local company of militia. And all of these captains would be put under the command of Uh, an overarching commander who they'd give the rank of Colonel Commandant. It would be the responsibility of the Colonel to organize, train, and direct the militia to respond to any threats from New York at a moment's notice anywhere in the grants. The militia was named, of course, the Green Mountain Boys, and Ethan Allen was unanimously, unanimously elected to the position of Colonel Commandant, and they began to organize their fight from their base of operations at the Catamount Tavern, tavern in bennington the boys identified themselves by sticking a twig from a fir tree into the brim of their tricorn caps that's how if if they were out on like patrol or anything they'd you could identify somebody was in the green mountain boys by looking at their hat they just have like a little fir twig sticking out so that you could they kind of just like wrote on the board hey i'm a green mountain boy oh yeah but that means they wouldn't end up like you always knew who to go to if like some New Yorkers were coming in to take your farm or whatever need it's, it's like the idea of putting cops in uh, cops in like high vis gear. Like they do in Britain. It's like, you got to be able to know where cops are so that you can, you can find them and get them to help you if you need them. Not like we do in the U S where we do everything in our power to make sure that cops blend in as much as possible because You know, we're a sick country. Anyways. Let's not even get started on that, but I agree. Yeah. Anyways. um, Yeah. So that's how they identified each other. And it was also like just a, it was like a symbol of pride thing. Like these fir trees grew everywhere in the Green Mountains and all throughout Vermont. And it was a very big part of like their everyday life. And so they took a lot of pride in that this is a part of, a, a part of the land that we're defending and we're carrying it with us as we go to fight New Yorkers. Um. Ethan himself uh, was always eager to to dress the part of a man of class, like we've mentioned. Uh, He wore a tailored green uh, military coat. Uh, It was like a dark green that matched the forest. And he wore the insignia designating his rank as colonel. And he also wore that uh, beaver tricord cap that we mentioned he bought and never paid for in the last episode. I didn't realize he was a colonel. Yeah, that that was his rank in the militia. Oh, in the militia, okay. Uh, yeah, so back that makes more sense. I was like, I didn't know he had military service before, like the revolution. Obviously, no. This was when he he was elected to the rank of colonel uh, by the uh, the committees of safety and the green and the New Hampshire grants. So by fall of seventeen seventy one, 
the Green Mountain Boys were regularly patrolling the border with New York, scaring off law enforcement and uh, posses for eviction from Albany. They were also turning their attention inward. They started targeting settlers who refused to help the cause because those some of those settlers actually owned grants from New York, not from New Hampshire. Ah. In October, Colonel Allen and his cousin, the now Captain Remember Baker, led a company of militia to kick out a settler in the town of Rupert, uh, who owned a New York grant. The militia tore down fences and burned haystacks in an attempt to intimidate him. But when that failed, when that failed to get the message across, they just burned his cabin to the ground and he was forced to flee to New York. Scenes like that played out all over the grants. New York grant owners were driven out of their homes and forced to flee while authorities in New York were mostly helpless to intervene because, you know, the they were actually pretty good at keeping like these posses and the, the lawmen at bay. All of these exploits were lifting Ethan to a sort of mythical status, both within the grants and all over the northern colonies in New England. Stories about his heroism and his physical strength, like uh, one story about spending two two nights in the woods looking for a lost child, and then when everybody thought they had both died, just coming out of the wood line with the child safe and happy. Uh, that was one story people told about him. Another story was one time he picked up two New Yorkers who were coming to evict a, a settler and picked both of them up by their necks and smashed their heads together. That was a that was a really popular story that was told about him because uh, remember he's like he's a pretty big dude. He was like six two, and he had some pretty like broad shoulders, and he was very he had a very intimidating silhouette. So a lot of a lot of he was basically like turning him into a superhero in New England. He like that's how a lot. Would it be more like a folk hero rather than a superhero? Yeah, a folk like Johnny Appleseed. Yeah, he was like he was like Paul Bunyan. He was like Paul Bunyan before Paul Bunyan. Like the idea of like this super super duper strong guy who can accomplish any feat, but at the same time he's like fighting against oppression and that kind of thing. That's the reputation he was developing in New England. And, of course, the officials back in New York were not very happy with what was happening in the grants. The new governor of New York, a guy named William Tryon, was a hard-ass of the highest degree. When I say hard-ass, I am not kidding. It's such, I, I am underplaying like how much of a hard-ass he is. There's no way to put into words like how harsh this guy is. Is he like that... Uh... That one military buzz cut hard ass. Um, think less like mili like military hard ass and more like dictator hard ass. Ugh. When he had been the governor, he had been the governor of South Carolina before he got to New York. Uh, when he was the governor of South Carolina in 1768 and 1771, settlers in the western regions of the colony had revolted against the Stamp Acts and later against the Townsend Acts and had called for greater representation within the colony's provincial assembly. This movement called themselves the Regulators. And they're a pretty big deal in like pre-revolutionary history. They're one of the precursors to the American Revolution. Okay. Tryon had passed a resol resolution declaring that the revolting colonists rebels or that the revolting colonists were rebels against the crown, which meant that they no longer had legal rights. And if they were captured, they wouldn't get a trial. They would just be summarily executed. And not just that, but executed in excruciatingly brutal ways. Uh, the colonial militia ended up brutally putting down the regulators. Dozens of people died in the process. And he publicly executed half a dozen of the movement's leaders. Dang. That was, this is the guy that uh, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys are now having to deal with. So, yeah, that's... Uh, that's exciting. That's crazy. That like went from zero to 60 in no time flat. Zero to 60 in fucking nothing. Like that's just this guy would also become like the arch uh, loyalist during the Revolutionary War. Like he was the the God Emperor of loyalism within ever based. Like he was the epitome of everything wrong with people who stay loyal to the crown during the Revolutionary War. 
just complete elitist asshole. So Governor Tryon had Ethan and seven other leaders, the Green Mountain Boys, declared outlaws and had a bounty placed on their heads of 20 pounds each or about $3,000 in today's money. When somebody read the proclamation of the bounty out loud at the, at the, at the Catamount Tavern and they got down to the governor's signature, Ethan apparently responded, your name is Tryon? Well, try on and be damned. It's a little bit of a, a colonial pun for you. It sounds like it would have been like solid delivered in the moment, but you had to be in the moment for it to hit, you know? I I guess. I. It was funny reading it. I mean, I'm sure once you get into the story, it's just... Well, it's just because his, his name is Tryon, and so he said, well, try on and be damned. As in like, the words try on. No, I get it. It just doesn't land for me, I guess. Okay, well, I'll just go fuck myself. Um, shortly after this declaration came out, Ethan, remember Baker, and another captain whose name was on the bounty list named Robert Cochran. Uh, they all sat down for drinks at the Catamount Tavern, which, yep. Mm. Oh, that was good. Yeah, so they sat down for drinks at the tavern. And they drafted their own bounty that they put out for James Dwayne and John Kempe. Remember those two assholes from the last episode? Vaguely, yes. Yeah, the the uh, one of the justices and the chief prosecutor for the state of New York. who The assholes who tried to bribe them. Yeah, the assholes who tried to bribe them. Uh, so they sat down and they wrote out a bounty on James Dwayne and John Kempe, Kempe offering 15 and 10 pounds for them respectively. And they deliberately made the bounties lower than uh, New York's bounty on them as like a fuck you saying, no, nah, you're one of you rich assholes is less wor- is worth less than a Green Mountain boy. <laughs> Basically telling him his life is worthless. Yeah, like your your life is objectively worth less than our lives. That's that's what he's saying. Um, the jokes didn't last long, you know, because it's a fuck kind of a fucked up story when you get down into the nitty gritty of it. And here's one of the fuck. I mean, history in general is fucked up, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Here's one of the fucked up bits. There's an officer and a lawman in New York, a military officer who is also a lawman in New York named John Monroe. And he decided that he wanted the bounty on Remember Baker's head. In March of 1772, he and a posse of 15 men surrounded Remember's home in Arlington late at night while he and his family slept. They broke down the door with an axe and both remember and his wife and bear with me, bear with me with his wife's with remember Baker's wife's name, a man named remember. His wife's name is desire. (laughs) This man got named weird and decided I'm going to have the weirdest taste to women. I'm going to get desire, not destiny, not Desiree desire this is my son deceitful and my daughter passionate they really are like like names that hippies would give their kids in the 60s it definitely feels like it frost just a reminder weird names get a shot this series oh yeah we forgot to read those out ah whatever so anyways so remember and his wife desire were both completely naked and they rushed up out of bed they and their 12-year-old son all attacked the intruders. What was the 12-year-old son's name? Oh, I actually don't know. Damn it. I didn't bother to write it down. Hack and a fraud. Hack and a fraud. It probably wasn't anything anything weird if it had been. I Or else you would have remembered. I Or else I would have deliberately put it into the script. I feel like even if it was a weird name, since you mentioned the wife and it's on the same amount, the sun would have come at the same time, so it would have been one shot anyway. Yeah, I guess. But yeah, so the three of them, I presume all of them butt-ass naked, all start to fight back against this pack of intruders. Desire and the sun were all slashed, or they were both slashed with a saber and knocked to the floor. And then Remember got chased out into the snow, again, naked. Middle of winter, just chasing them naked. Real men. They finally captured him outside in the snow. At some point during this fight, his right thumb was cut off. And we're not exactly sure how it got cut off. Remember Baker? Or the the guy who tried to kill Baker? Remember Baker? Uh, Remember. Okay. 
Yeah, so Remember's thumb got cut off. Either it had been slashed off by one of the attacker's sabers during the fight, or according to another story, which is, you know, kind of more apocryphal, Monroe, Monroe actually held him down and chopped off his thumb with an axe. Ooh, damn. Either either way, he only has one thumb now. So the gang, this gang tied up Remember to a sleigh, again, completely naked, snowy, middle of winter. They started dragging him towards the New York border. Desire rushed to a neighbor's house and called for the boys to, to yeah, called for the boys to come out and chased after them to get her husband back. Within just a few minutes, an entire company of militia were chasing after Remember and his captors on horseback. Sounds about right. They managed to catch up to them and chase the Yorkers off. Uh, Remember was half conscious from blood loss and the cold, but he ended up making a full recovery and returned to his duties soon after. Again, though, minus a thumb. Ethan's response to that came soon after, and, you know, I gotta respect Ethan for doing this. I just think it's kind of underkill based on what just happened to his best friend. He basically responds to assault and mutilation with a prank. So one night, Ethan and some other Green Mountain boys were drinking at the Catamount Tavern. Yep. So anyways, they're drinking. They're drunk. Like us. Like us. One of them dared Ethan to ride into Albany. Again, New York, the place where he's now outlawed. And post a copy of the bounty that they had written for Dwayne and Kempe in one of those the taverns in Albany. Guess what this idiot does? He does it. He does it. The next day, he rode the 60 miles from Bennington to Albany. He walked into the Benedict Tavern. He ordered a bowl of punch, which punch in Colonial America, it was like a, it was a bowl of watered down rum with sugar and citrus peels. It's kind of like a really crappy jungle juice, basically. <sighs> yeah, really, really shitty jungle juice. Um, so, yeah, he ordered a bowl of punch. Everybody in the tavern immediately recognizes him and knows he's got like a $3,000 bounty on him. So they form a crowd around him. He is completely unfazed by this. He gets a bowl. He downs the entire thing without breathing. He pays for it. And then he hands the the bounty poster to the bartender and he just walks out. Balls of enormous steel. Okay, yeah, balls of steel. But then, but then real life hits him again, because because when he he gets back to the Grants and people are sick of Ethan's shit because he's doing like dumb pranks like this all the time. And another thing that's going on is that he's still like writing stuff for like papers back in Connecticut, and he's still like a very much like a very avowed deist, a very vocal about it, very critical of religion, and he's still doing this while he's in the New Hampshire grants and a lot of his neighbors and a lot of the people in the, in the grants are still like pretty devout Christians of some form or another. Oh, so he he's pissing people off left and right. Yeah. Yeah. He's still pissing people off. And then on top of that, he's supposed to be the leader of the militia that's defending them from having literally having them kicked off of their homes. So Ethan, he's in a position of leadership. He's supposed to be responsible for defending everybody's homes from the specter of redcoats marching in and evicting them from their homes. And he's going off and doing dumb pranks like this. It's, it, he's being in it, kind of an asshole. About Only kind of? Yeah. Um, during the spring and summer of 1772, rumors were circulating that Governor Tryon was assembling redcoats along the Hudson River so that he could march on Bennington. It was looking like this small-scale guerrilla war that they were fighting was about to become like a full-fledged campaign. So while Ethan was preparing defenses in Bennington, a conservative faction was forming within the Green Mountain movement, which included uh, a lot of older, older folks, like town elders throughout the grants. And it also included Ethan's cousin and old friend Seth Warner. So these these conservatives, what they wanted to do was uh, they they just wanted to do everything in their power to scale back tensions with New York by any means necessary. And they wanted to prevent all out conflict with diplomacy because they thought I had. So you're saying the 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 um, the grants flinched. Yeah. Yeah. They flinched. And you don't flinch with a guy like Tryon or 
Yeah, try on. Um, in June of 1772, a delegation of Grant settlers returned from a meeting personally with Governor Tryon, who they said had made a promise to cease all efforts to evict the New Hampshire Grant settlers until the king had responded to their petition. I don't know if you remember this, but I mentioned that there was a petition that they sent off like at this point, like five years ago. You mentioned how it wouldn't come about to like way later to the get a response or get to him. I can't remember if there's a response or not. Yeah, it, it turns out there's never going to be a response. Dang. Um, because uh, I forgot to mention this. Um, the government of New Hampshire had made a secret agreement with New York not to press their claims on the New Hampshire grants in order to prevent a conflict with New York. And one of the stipulations of that was that Whenever they received a, um, uh, whenever they received a petition from the Grant settlers, uh, they just wouldn't send it off to the king. So their petition that they were staking all their hopes on was never going to arrive. Of course, it had been burned in a fireplace five years before. Sounds about right. So. The Council of Town Elders assembled in Bennington and voted unanimously to cease hostilities with New York. Now, Ethan thought that that was a horrible, awful idea. And which, you know, I kind of don't like Ethan like as a person, but I kind of got to have to agree with him on this. But I guess I'm kind of biased because I know that he gets proven right. So, but to a lot of New Ham- Ham- a lot of people in the New Hampshire grants, it seemed like... uh. They would all, it seemed like this was the best case scenario that eventually they would be able to work it out and they'd be able to keep their farms. This ceasefire lasted just under a month. Oh, I was going for like less than a day. Yeah, you'd think it, it this is, uh, these are landlords we're talking about here. Um, remember Baker received. The only reason it lasted that long is they were trying to maneuver where they could win, basically. Uh, the reason it lasted that long was because of the the slow time it took to communicate. Okay, that makes more sense. Um, remember Baker received word that a settlement of New Hampshire grant holders had been driven out of their homes by a group of armed settlers from New York. He led his company of boys out to the settlement, and after a brief standoff with the Yorkers, they agreed to leave with their belongings. After they left, the militia burned down all of their cabins. Then, in September, Remember and Ethan's brother Ira Allen, who was another captain in the Green Mountain Boys, discovered a New York survey team who were in violation of the ceasefire by being in the grants. Like, part of the agreement, the ceasefire agreement, was that they'd stop sending both eviction teams, lawmen, and survey teams in to the grants. So just explicit violation of the ceasefire. You didn't really expect that end to be holed up for very long. Any... Oh, no, absolutely not. No. I mean, we're talking about very, very wealth, like very rich land here. Like there's a lot of money on the line we're talking about. We're talking about greed, pure and simple. So this uh, survey team was sent away with a warning that they would be killed if they returned. And also a bunch of the Green Mountain Boys like just stole all of their stuff before they left. Which, you know, I kind of, you know, the alternative is you kill them. So I can't really like, I, I can't fault, completely fault them for just taking some stuff. No, like, I'm pretty sure, like, at least the people that were sent on behalf of the Lambarns, I guarantee the Lambarns didn't care, but like... The people who they had that had to go and like actually enforce the the rich people's will were like, I really don't want to hurt someone. I'm getting paid money, so I'll do it. But if I don't have to, when Tryon heard about this, he brought up charges on both Ira and Remember, and he put out another bounty on them. This time worth a hundred pounds each, which is you know several thousand dollars. It's a lot of money. Violence resumed. And by summer of 1773, the conflict was even more intense than it had been a year before. That does not surprise me. New York had organized some land in the western parts of the Grants into a new county, which they called Charlotte County. 
and they had appointed officials to govern the area under New York law. In November of that year, Ethan led a raid on the home of a New York judge in Charlotte County in the town of Durham named Benjamin Spencer. Late at night, very similar to what happened to Remember, actually, like the table's kind of turning now, a large group of Green Mountain boys beat down the judge's door with an axe and held him and his family at gunpoint. Ethan ordered the man to get dressed, but when he took too long getting dressed, hoping to stall for time until some New York reinforcements could come, Ethan hit him over the head with the butt of his musket. That sounds like Ethan. Yeah, that's that's some classic Ethan. That's our Ethan. They took the man away, and they held a mock trial. Basically just... They were making basically making fun of, like, New York's legal system, and they set up, like... Like, they made Ethan the judge, and they had, like, an, a jury of all Green Mountain boys, and uh, it, it was just... just just to harass the, the guy and make fun of him. And, but in this mock trial, they charged him with crimes against settlers of the New Hampshire grants. Uh, they declared that his house was a public nuisance and sentenced it to be burned down. The guy protested, of course, because, you know, if you burn down my house, my now traumatized wife and children, who you've just held at gunpoint, are all going to be homeless. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, and so Ethan saw a PR opportunity, and he offered mercy. He offered the lesser sentence that, um, he gave him a choice. The first choice was you'd be allowed to keep your house intact, but we'll only take the roof off. So <laughs> that was the first choice. The second choice was they would leave the judge and his family alone if he agreed to buy a lease from New Hampshire for the land that he was on and relinquish his grant from New York, which would then put him in the situation where his entire livelihood is now wrapped up in the cause that is... Because once he does that, he'll be considered legally a squatter in the New York legal system. And so he'll have to rely on the Green Mountain Boys to protect his home from New York, who will then come after him. Were those the only two, or were there... Those were the only two options. Either you lose your roof, or you lose your New York grant. How did the... Was it just supposed to be, like, destruction of his property to lose the roof, or was that, like, a meaning back then? It was just... It was, it was a joke, because the, at first they threatened to burn his house down, and then he asked for leniency... And so they said, okay, we won't burn your house down. We'll just take the roof off. So they're kind of they're. It was a serious offer, but they were kind of fucking with him. Okay. That makes more sense. So of course he took the, I'll buy the New Hampshire grant lease and the green mountain boys cheered and celebrated their victory the rest of the night with binge drinking. Sounds about right. Uh, the rest of the New York settlers in the town of Durham, were deeply intimidated by this whole chain of events. And they all quickly followed suit and bought uh, New Hampshire grants themselves. So just like a little timeline uh, guesstimate, how far out is it before Vermont actually establishes itself in the storyline? Um, let's see, it's 1773 right now, so four years. Okay. See, this is something I, I had no idea about. That I, I didn't know much about like Vermont's history. Yeah, at this point, um at this point the settlers still consider themselves part of New Hampshire. Even though New Hampshire isn't doing shit to help them. Um, but their grants are through New Hampshire. They're relying on New Hampshire's uh government legitimacy in order to uphold their rights to the land that they own. So at this point they're they they're still like, yeah, we we're li we live under the law of New Hampshire, not the law of New York. That's their thing. It won't it'll be it won't be for another little while until the idea of like an independent Vermont becomes a thing. Okay. On the night of December sixteenth, seventeen seventy three, just a couple weeks after Judge Spencer's trial, 
a group of activists in Boston who were members of the Sons of Liberty prepared themselves for some good old-fashioned rioting and destruction of property. I mean, as one does. As one does. Among the mob's leaders was Samuel Adams, like I said before, leader of the Boston Sons of Liberty, future signer of the Declaration of Independence, and cousin to the first vice president and second president of the United States, John Adams. Also, among the leadership of this mob was Ethan's old friend and mentor from Salisbury, Dr. Thomas Young. So he's coming up again. Nice. This mob was dressed in disguises so that they would look like Mohawk people, Mohawk native people. Was that a specific tribe? Yeah, like the the Mohawk tribe. The the uh the the ones that I mentioned in the last episode, their actual name is the Haudenosaunee, I think is how it's pronounced. Okay. I couldn't remember if you had or not. Like it vaguely sounded familiar, but like Mohawk tribe is pretty generic, so I wanted to make sure. Yeah, uh, it's a it is a specific indigenous nation and they they're still around today too. Okay. Most 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 of them are uh, in most of them are classified First Nations up in Canada. Because you know we displaced just about all of the native people from their land. Well, most of their ter- most of their historic territory was actually in uh, in what's now Canada. Only part portions of it were in like New York and uh, what's now Vermont. Careful there. Sounds like you're defending the white man. <laughs> Oh, no, they still got fucked over, including by George Washington. George Washington led a genocidal campaign against them when he was, uh, yeah, when he was president. And before he was president. Throughout our history, we have screwed over the natives. And it's not even funny because like, oh, it's our land. No, it was their land. And we were just like, ooh, find your keepers when that wasn't even really the case it's ridiculous looking back on our history how that's not like a focus at least like hey we were kind of in the wrong because of course they're not going to admit taking america was wrong yeah the the population of indigenous people between 1492 and today the population of indigenous people in north america dropped by 97 percent 97% that's an apocalypse yeah that is that is literally they it native people in North America are living through post-apocalypse that is their lives that's in it we can't even fathom that experience we've never experienced anything close like as a demographic anyways before we get even deeper into that um yeah so this mob they dressed up as of Mohawk people, and they marched themselves down to the Boston Harbor. They raided several ships that were owned by the British East India Company. And before a cheering crowd of 3,000 Bostonians, they threw 342 chests filled with tea into the harbor. The total losses amounted to around 10,000 pounds, which is millions of dollars in modern money. Parliament responded by completely blockading Boston ports. That sounds about right. Yep. And then they dissolved the Massachusetts Assembly. And they put almost the entire colony under military occupation. Again, sounds about white. (laughs) The British government's harsh crackdown on radicals in the colonies that was now happening in response to the Boston Tea Party. Uh, It encouraged New York to take the next step against the New Hampshire grants. On March 9th, 1774, a resolution was passed in the New York government, which came to be called the Bloody Acts. So was, did they know it was going to be bloody? And is that why it was named? Or like, retrospect, it was bloody? It was, it, it was, they called it the Bloody Acts because of what the provisions in the acts were. So for the shot, This bill was authored by a man named Creon Brush. First name Creon, C-R-E-O-N, Creon Brush. That is such a weird name. Like, what? I, this, this entire experience has made me realize that the American Revolution was actually a net positive for the world, 
or at least for the United States, because then we got rid of all of the shitty British names. I mean, fair enough. Fair enough. Cheers. Yeah, Prost. The act outlawed, once again, like they've been outlawed two or three times by this point, but the act outlawed several leaders of the Green Mountain movement by name. I'll list out these names for you. It would be helpful. (laughs) Um, The first four you've heard of already, Ethan Allen, Seth Warner, Remember Baker, and Robert Cochran. Along with a few town leaders in Bennington, Peleg Sunderland. We're only counting all these names as one, just at FYI. Yeah, I know. There's there's four names here, but only two of them are weird. But, okay. Peleg Sunderland, P-E-L-E-G, Sylvanus Brown, S-I-L-V-A-N-U-S, Sylvanus Brown. And then John Smith and a guy we've already met before, James Breckenridge. So. Cheers. Prost. To hell with the English English language. I mean, English is a ridiculous language, to be perfectly honest. I hate this language. <laughs> well, if you hate the language so much, why do you speak it? Because colonization. Because colonization. <laughs> uh, because uh, the federal government and the state government of Texas forced my people to forget our our ancestral traditions and language to assimilate into American white culture. Anyways, uh, yeah, so the Bloody Acts also declared that any more action taken by the Bennington mob, quote-unquote, would be treated as capital offenses, meaning if any Green Mountain boy was caught expelling Yorkers, it was the death penalty. Finally, it decreed that Ethan and the other outlaws named had 70 days to surrender. And after that 70 days, they would face execution without trial upon their arrest. Ethan and the other leaders of the Grants were now, in the eyes of the law, rebels and traitors against the crown. I mean, weren't they kind of already traitors against the crown, to be fair? They were still... There there was, up until this point, pretty much, there was still an argument, and I guess there's still, even after this, an argument to be made that, they're, that they are acting in self-defense and that they their rights as Englishmen are being infringed upon by the law of New York. I mean, honestly, it does. It wouldn't have cost the New Yorkers to be like, hey... We get that there was confusion with this charge, like a nominal fee or like do a payment plan or something on the fees. I don't know if they did or not. And like basically try and get the settlers on their side, be like, okay, because there couldn't have been like a super whole lot of the settlers from the New Hampshire grants compared to how much there would eventually be. Yeah. Um, at this point, there's about. 8,000 people settled in the grants. Um, the thing with that is that that at one point, New York does actually offer. They offered to sell New York grants for the land that they lived on for dirt cheap. And a lot of the, uh, the settlers in the grants actually did take it. But the thing was, it wasn't just uh, a matter of like property. There was also an ideological bent to it. Oh, no, definitely. Like, after... If the, I, so you're more familiar with it. If they had right off the bat, like, okay, we can't just say that you guys, we recognize it right away. But if you guys basically pay like barely anything or like do something for the New York government, we will just call it even, but we can't do any more grants from New Hampshire. It would have turned out this way, or you think it still would have gone that way this way the thing with it is is that it never could have gone that way because a lot of the a lot of the settlers in the grants at that moment were settled on land that was that the new york grant had gone to wealthy landowners who were in position of power oh so what you're saying is they had doubled issued for specific land i thought it was more like okay they're this area is in control. They 
different places want to issue them. I didn't realize it was specific land had been double issued. Yeah, they're like a grant is like a specific plot of land. Okay. So if you buy a grant, you have a specific like like grid pattern block of land. Interesting. Um and a lot of a lot of the grants in in the in the New Hampshire what would become Vermont uh that were issued by New York were owned by some of these guys we're talking about like James Dwayne and John Kempe. And they they were they come from families and traditions of like these enormous landowners that make their living off of uh, tenant farmers who pay rent to them. And that's the system that they were trying to set up in Vermont. And so a lot most of the people that were involved in the Green Mountain movement uh, were either going to be faced with the prospect of getting evicted off of this land or having to become tenant farmers under an absentee landowner. No, th- that puts everything in a completely different perspective. I was under the assumption that it wasn't like a double claimant of specific property. I thought it was just general, oh, they didn't have the right to sell that. We're going to recharge you or something similar. No, yeah, it's yeah, that was the that was the argument on the surface that New York was saying that um, just that these people are settling on land that was sold to them by new hampshire that new hampshire didn't have the right to sell so if they just come to us in new york we can uh we can resell the grants to them they could they could keep the land that's the pitch that was being given when in reality what would have happened is a lot of that land would have they would have been evicted anyways and that land would have gone to expanding the holdings and the assets of the, all of the people who were creating these policies in the first place. Okay, that makes a whole lot more sense. So yeah, um, despite all of their problems, and I'm not going to lie, the Green Mountain Boys had a lot of problems. I'm 100% on their side here. <laughs> you know, it, it certainly sounds like it. It, it This whole thing feels uh-huh. like the New Yorkers refused to be like, work with them at all, basically. They may have like, on the surface pretended that they were trying to work with them, but no, they like they were just trying to abuse the people who had the New Hampshire grants. That part of it is a lot of that was just like the mentality of the, like the culture of the people that we're talking about. So guys like Tryon and, uh, and Kempe and Dwayne came from backgrounds of aristocracy. It might've been aristocracy by a different name, but it was still like they, they are landowners and they have like subservient people who live under them. They are elitist people. It's why, it's why colonies like New York and Virginia and Georgia had so many, had a, had so many such large populations that stayed loyal to the crown during the revolution is because they fundamentally had an ideology of elitism which fit perfectly well with the crown and in opposition with like the Republican ideals that the revolutionaries were fighting for. So that that's a big part of it is they just don't consider these settlers in the New Hampshire grants to be really human. No, it doesn't sound like it. It it sounded like they refused to see them as equals. So they were going to scam, abuse, do whatever they could to them to get advantage. Yeah. Yeah, and in a lot of the literature that I read for this, they're very open about that. They consider all of these people... I mean, that's why they refer to them as squatters, because squatters are, are criminals. They Like, they consider them to be a criminal element that needs to be purged. Which is honestly... I wouldn't say in every case, but in some cases, squatters are just trying to live somewhere sometimes. Like, yeah. They're just trying to survive, my dude. Yeah, there's there's a whole conversation we could have right now about unhoused people and how their situation in life and the suffering that is happening to them is largely caused by policy failures and an economy based on profit we could talk about that and the the intricacies of like a lot of the stuff we're talking about right now like the fact that uh landlords like really just don't see their tenants as anything more than assets or property they don't they they honestly don't at least regular landlords you know like people who okay this is rented out 364 days a year like i'm not trying to say every landlord is bad or every landlord is good but like 
people who are like, hey, occasionally I'll rent out this room or something is a little bit different than like, hey, I'm going to tell you you have to pay this much to live here. And that's the thing that I tell people. I don't, despite what you might see me talk about on Twitter, I shit post on Twitter a lot, but I don't think all landlords are bad people. I think all landlords have a strong economic incentive to be bad people. Agreed. Like, like as someone who, with the current way our system is, would love to one day be, like, own land. I don't know if I want to be a landlord because that's, like, a lot of hassle, per se. Like, even if, like, you're doing everything morally good, it's just, like, trying to be the in the moral right as a landlord takes a lot of work. And I just don't know if I want that responsibility knowing I could screw that up, you know? Yeah, that's the thing for me is like I I could never do that because the way that I see it at its core, it's fundamentally like being a landlord is fundamentally leveraging the human need for shelter in order to enrich yourself. At, and and a fundamental aspect of that is restricting the access of all people to be able to have housing. That is a necessary prerequisite because if everybody had access to housing, nobody would be buying or renting. And the only way I can see like being a, like me being a landlord as something I would be morally okay with as a person would be like, okay, I am, I'm not, yes, I am bringing in some kind of profit just to like create a nest egg in case something happens to the property, but I'm really just doing it for, to one, keep it out of like corporations hands if I have like the money, whatever, but like, I probably wouldn't, to be honest, but I, I wouldn't try and like, okay, I'm trying to become rich off of this. I, that, that wouldn't be me. Oh yeah, no, absolutely not. Yeah. So now the green mountain boys were now rebels and traitors. Ethan responded the way I haven't really brought it up a lot. I mentioned that he was doing it like in the first episode, but I haven't brought it back up since then. But so Ethan responded to this the way that he would respond to a lot of things around this time. And that was, he started to write. I don't remember him being a writer. I don't remember you mentioning that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I met, Yeah, I mentioned it. He's he's a scholar at heart. He's always writing about. Well, I know he tried to like get into like, I can't remember which, was it Yale? Was the prestigious university? I remember there was a, a prestigious university he tried to get into, but he didn't get to finish his, um, uh, tutoring i think to be able to get in right yeah um but yeah he was still a prolific writer like that's whenever he had free time that's what he was doing was he was reading or he was writing so all of this time during all of this stuff we've been talking about this episode he has been writing articles for a whole bunch of different newspapers all throughout new england especially in connecticut and this time in response to the bloody acts he wrote <laughs> <laughs> did he do something cringy it's not cringy it's just it, 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 here he wrote a work titled this is the title a brief narrative of the proceedings of the government of new york so th those first three words a brief narrative i want you to guess how many pages it was so the way you're talking about it i'm guessing brief as facetious um can i i'm gonna guess if it was bound it was like an inch thick as a traditional book that's the only way i can like truly say it because i can't guess correctly on pages yeah i don't know how thick it would have been but it was 224 pages that's like two and a half inches i i want to guess i'm not perfect on that guesstimation i guess it depends on font size but yeah so that was his brief narrative and page size that was his brief narrative it was 224 pages in it he outlined both the legal and the philosophical defenses for the claims of the settlers of the New Hampshire grant. And he spent a lot of ink explaining in the flowery words, the flowery words of his favorite Enlightenment thinkers, explaining why all of the rich landlords who run the colony in New York are all corrupt sons of bitches. <laughs> that sounds about right. He used very tactful, if a bit sarcastic language. But the its essential premise was these people are sons of bitches, and if they come here, we're gonna kill them. And he presented it in like the language of enlightenment philosophy. <laughs> um, yeah. So 
Then Ethan rounded up his boys, and they went on another raid, once again back to the town of Durham. They had discovered that one of the settlers there, who was an Anabaptist preacher named Benjamin Hoff, had provided testimony about the last raid on Durham that they had done to the New York government, which is what prompted them to begin drafting the Bloody Acts. On January 26, 1775, they dragged the reverend out of his home and held another mock trial. Who did? The Green Mountain Boys. Okay. Like, were they not happy with the way he acted afterwards? What was... This was... This is a different guy from the guy who had the first mock trial. This was another guy who lived in the same town. Oh, okay. I thought this was the same guy. No, this is a different. No, this is the first guy was a judge. This guy's a reverend. Now that you mentioned it, I do remember. I just another mock trial. I just for some reason, I thought it was the same guy. So this this is the dark side of the green. I'm guessing they mutilated him if you say it's the dark side of basically yes. In this mock trial he was sentenced to two th- 200 lashes from a beech switch. So a switch made from beech wood. I can't imagine that. 200 lashes. Ooh. He was then banished and threatened that if he returned he would receive 500 lashes. Which 500 lashes will kill you. I'm surprised 200 didn't. 200 did kill a lot of people, but it was usually survival. 500, nobody survives that many. At this point, all of the leaders of the Grants were essentially dead men walking. So now they're pulling out all the stops. The flogging of Reverend Hoff would go down as one of the most brutal and horrific acts of the Green Mountain Boys, though it would not be their last. That doesn't surprise me. During this time, two ideas started to float around the, float around the New Hampshire Grants. The first was the idea that the Grant settlers should start thinking about breaking away and formally breaking away formally from their tenuous connection to New Hampshire, who, as many pointed out at the time, had completely ignored and remained completely neutral in the conflict between the Grants and New York. And they thought that maybe we should form our own government. This is this wasn't coming to fruition anytime soon. This is just when it was starting to. This is kind of when they had the idea to break away form. Yeah. This is... They didn't get there yet, but they were coming up with the idea. The second idea, which Ethan outlined in a letter that he sent to a friend of his in Connecticut. This guy was a fellow radical named Oliver Wolcott, who was another future signer of the Declaration of Independence. I've never heard of Oliver Wolcott. Yeah, he was he was a representative to the... Con- uh, the Continental Congress from Connecticut and didn't play a huge role, but his name was on the document. He's one of the people, yeah, he got to sign, but he didn't really matter. I think, I'm sure he did other stuff, like other important stuff in Connecticut. He may have been important, but he didn't leave his mark. Is a better way? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the second idea, which Ethan first expressed to his friend Oliver Wolcott, quote, provided the controversy between Great Britain and the colonies should terminate a war, The regiment of the Green Mountain Boys will, I dare, engage to assist their American brethren in the capacity. So I didn't realize the term America came around that early. When did the term America come around? Um, I think the earliest uses are like the mid to late 1500s. Oh, wow. I thought. Yeah, it was it was already called America by this North and South America by this point. I thought that was like. A couple years after the revolutions, it was called the Americas. I thought it was still called the New World or like something. The colonies. No, like they, like they, they called them like the American colonies, and like Mexico was called like Spanish America, and uh, Brazil was Portuguese America. It was, it was already a thing. I guess the um, whatever the explore Spanish explorer's name was that America is named after happened a lot earlier than I thought in my head. It was actually an Italian merchant. Uh, Italian, sorry. Yeah. His name was Amerigo Vespucci. Amerigo Vespucci, yes. I, I We didn't go super in detail on that, so I don't remember it as well. Yeah, yeah. I didn't learn that in school, so I actually learned that from Assassin's Creed. I learned it in school because we focused, for some reason, on explorers in like elementary a lot. 
but we didn't really do in depth knowledge on them. Like they were people, they did things, they are known for this thing, but th we didn't talk about like what was going on at the time that they did their things. We didn't talk about how important at the time their things were. Like, yes, they this is an important thing they did, but it's not like, okay, we didn't give context to what they did at the time they did it kind of thing. Yeah, the but or at least I'm not remembering the context, you know, American schooling. If I remember correctly, the reason that it was named after that the continents were named after him was because he was he was a cartographer. And uh, prior to his work mapping the the islands of the Caribbean and the the original Spanish territories in America, uh, everybody still believed that it was India. And so it was his maps that finally pop like um, popularized the like made popular the realization that this was an entirely new continent. And so the also it was a we didn't talk about the translation from realizing that it's not india yeah it it happened relatively quickly like like well like that's not talked about when in my like um at, like education like yes we knew it was we didn't talk about like there was okay they figured out it wasn't india it's just implied i guess that they figured it out yeah and i don't i don't that's one I'm not going to hold that against them because it's not really a it it's you can skim over it by saying at first the the original explorers thought that they were landing in India and then so they made some maps and realized pretty quickly oh, this is in India. I guess you could figure it out pretty quickly. It's just like they didn't even say they figured it out, though, at least not that to my memory. It's, again, I have bad memory, though, too. And I grew up in a small town, so it's probably not representative of proper American education, even though proper American education on history is not great in the first place. Well, anyways, um, but yeah, so basically what Ethan is saying there in this letter is if war breaks out between the, the colonies and Britain, then the Green Mountain Boys will fight for the colonies. Which we could have just just extrapolated without him saying that like there was no doubt in my mind that they would fight for the colonies to be honest well you'd be surprised there's going to be a lot of green mountain boys that become loyalists what yeah that's kind of a hard pill to swallow for me yeah um we're gonna get into him in the next episode but one of the leaders of the british spy network in the northern in new england during the war was a guy named Justice Sherwood, who was a captain in the Green Mountain Boys and a childhood friend of Ethan Allen. Is this, um, I remember, I think during the Civil War, there's a famous Sherwood. Is there a relation or is this just the same last name? No idea. I, I don't know anybody in the Civil War named Sherwood. For some reason, I'm remembering, and I have bad memory and like no historical education. Like that's a of substance and value but sherwood sounds like it's like an important name i remember for somewhere in history lesson uh sherwood forest and the story of robin hood no it's like at like american history um i don't know probably not because after the war he moves up to canada and lives out the rest of his life up there so but yeah so You're thinking Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman, the guy who burned down Atlanta. Yeah. But yeah, so it, it wouldn't. It did like. If the war had because at this point, like the Green Mountain Boys are still like like they're singing drinking songs and about about England and toasting to the king like they're not exactly like revolutionaries at this point i didn't figure they'd be toasting to the king at this point like i didn't figure they'd be like you know cursing the king per se if that's how you want to put it but i didn't assume they had any love for the king i guess you could say well up until the king up until the bloody acts they were still relying on like crown law to justify their claims to 
the New Hampshire grants. I just kind of assumed that was like a, okay, let's work it within the system that's there. Not that they necessarily agreed with it. Yeah, but like, there's also this cultural thing that like there's at the time, Englishmen very much prided themselves on that, that England as a culture very much valued the concept of personal liberty and freedom. It was it, like, that's why it was on the cutting edge of the enlightenment, the industrial revolution, um, it, the development of institutions like private property is because England had such a deep rooted idea of uh, like legal and economic liberty and the weird thing was for centuries the king was seen to embody to be embodied as like the protector of those liberties and that it was the king who carried out the law but the law protected the people and their rights that's that's how english people saw themselves at this time that's bullshit though yeah it's bullshit (laughs) It is bullshit. Like, that's very obvious not how that works. Yeah. um, The American colonies agreed. That's why they had the revolution. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, but that that was the whole thing. Like, like that was the origin of of things like no taxation without representation. They thought parliament was an inherently democratic. So you're saying they implicitly trust the idea idea of their system do it they implicitly trusted the idea of their system they just didn't kind of trust the people who were enforcing it in the new world per se is that yeah that was that was actually how they saw it for um like during the stamp acts they uh whenever it started to happen it, it was less more like crown authorities in the in the new world it was more like um like parliament was doing something wrong. And so they appealed to the King to get parliament in line and protect their liberties. That's how it was like during the stamp act, during the, the stamp act, uh, the protests against the stamp acts. So that's the idea that they had. That boggles my mind because like, if I, if I made that conclusion that like, Hey, the people who we have elected aren't doing their job, I would s- start to doubt the King too, or say the president, a, or whatever like say i didn't trust local elections or whatever that's like saying you trust local elections versus like federal elections don't trust local but trust federal that that that's mind-boggling yeah and but yeah so like that's that's why so many people stayed loyal to the crown A, a, a large portion of it was just elitism a lot of people thought that the colonists were being uppity and that they should be put back and put in their place but a lot of people genuinely believed in uh, the parliamentary uh, or the constitutional monarchy of the British government, and they believed that it was the best hope for protecting their liberties. They saw the republicanism and the representative democracy of of the of the new United States as too democratic and would result in mob rule, and then that mob rule would destroy their individual rights. I've got us. I guess. It- they didn't question stuff as much as we do now because like you couldn't have like the, I literally question literally everything. I want to know as much as I can, if I care about it or if I trust it, you know, but it it doesn't seem like they they tried or cared to look into things further. Yeah. There's or like, there's a lot wonder why things are the way they were at least. Or you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, it was, it it was the enlightenment like there a lot of people were doing exactly that and a lot of those people were the kind of people who rejected the idea of nobility and the crown and adopted republicanism so it, it that was something that people were doing and that was becoming like a main so this is the beginning of that is what you're saying like yeah it's it's, it's the beginning of like the development of like a rational view of existence and a rational view of how society. And so Ethan Allen was basically saying in that letter to his friend Oliver Wolcott that uh, if Great Britain and the colonies go to war, the Green Mountain Boys will be on the side of the colonies. Yes, I I remember you mentioned that. The time for Ethan to make good on his word was close at hand, and the Green Mountain Boys were about to step up in a very, very huge way. Were they? Like getting involved in the revolution big way or like. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Getting involved. Nobody has gotten as involved in anything as the Green Mountain Boys are about to get involved in the American Revolution. <laughs> but you said that uh, Ethan Allen bows out pretty early. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he does. Was he just a rare... Was he like... Did something else come up and the rest of the Green Mountain Boys stay in the Revolution? Or did the all the Mountain Boys pull out? No, he something happens and the Green Mountain Boys have to go on without him. Okay, interesting. I assumed... But they get in really, really early. So, so let's, we're about to slog a little bit. I think this is the most interesting part of the episode, but it's Massachusetts was being put under increasing military occupation. Radicals, both in Boston and all over the countryside, were beginning to stockpile weapons and ammunition in the event that they would have to face down redcoats coming for their livelihoods and their homes. One of these stockpiles was in the rural Massachusetts town of lexington in february 1775 hold on there's a lexington massachusetts yeah i had no idea <laughs> you learned about it in fifth grade history class i thought there was a lexington texas there's a lexington in pretty much every state it's a pretty common town name i didn't know that <laughs> okay hold on we're about to talk about lexington and concord how have you not heard about that Small town, shitty education. You haven't heard of Lexington and Concord. I probably have, but probably got my wires crossed, to be perfectly honest. The shot heard around the world. Yes, I've heard of that. That was at Lexington, Massachusetts. From what I remember in my American history class, they talked about the shot around, heard around the world, but I don't remember them at least emphasizing where it happened. They just talked about how it was an important event. Okay. Um, either you just you were just really weren't interested in history as a kid, or you went to a really shitty school. Because <laughs> holy fuck, it was probably a little column A, a little column B. Okay, yeah. No. So February seventeen seventy five, the Parliament in London, which was becoming increasingly nervous at the buildup of militias in Massachusetts declared that the colony was in a state of rebellion and ordered the de facto military governor of Boston, General Sir Thomas Gage, to seize the rebel weapons and arrest the ringleaders. In April, a warrant was put out for the arrest of Samuel Adams and John Hancock, who, by the way, John Hancock, another future signer of the Declaration of Independence. I would have never guessed. Mr. I started, can I get you John Hancock? Yeah. The guy with the largest signature on the Declaration of Independence. Isn't that exactly why the term John Hancock came about? It's because of he wanted to draw attention, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's exactly why. Uh, so, yeah, warrants were put out for their arrest, and troops were sent to Lexington to seize a weapon stockpile. Rebels still in Boston, however, were closely watching troop movements, and they knew, and they knew that the British were on their way to Lexington. So late on the night of April 18th, 1775, three rebels from Boston, William Dawes, Samuel Prescott, and the more famous of the three of them, Paul Revere, rode out to warn the militia that the regulars were out and on their way to Lexington. This is the midnight ride of Paul Revere. There were three of them. And also, I really, I got to get this out of the way. He didn't say the British are coming. Because at the time, I assumed that was just like a, I assumed that was like kind of like a sensationalism. The British are coming. The British are coming. I, I assumed that was like propaganda, basically. Uh, well, because because the, at the time they still considered themselves British. That the independence thing hadn't come up yet, and so it wouldn't make sense for them to say the British are coming. So what they were, at, what Paul Revere was actually yelling as he was running through these towns late at night. He was yelling, the regulars are out, which everybody knew exactly what that meant. It meant the regulars were coming to take, they're coming to take our guns. That They're coming to take their guns. Anyways, uh, 700 redcoats arrived around sunrise, turning a corner to find themselves confronted by 300 townspeople and 70 Minutemen. Minutemen were militia who had been, they'd been training all winter. And they were called Minutemen because they were supposed to be ready to go to fight the British Redcoats at a mo at a minute's notice. So from the moment they found out to the moment they were grabbing their musket and leaving the house, 
that it was going to be a minute. That was the idea anyways. But they found 300 townspeople and 70 Minutemen assembled on the town commons. I I thought that was pretty boastful to think they'd be ready in under a minute, even for today. It wasn't that much of an exaggeration. Uh, during this, the battles of Lexington and Concord, the ranks of the rebels swell from less than 100 to over 3,000 in a matter of a few hours because the militia is able to rally so quickly. So there was some truth to it, but we'll get to that. The commander of the British force, Major John Pitcairn, ordered the militia to disperse and sent several troops to disarm some of them. Nobody knows who fired the shot heard around the world, as Ralph Walder, Waldo Emerson would call it in a poem 62 years later. But soon, Minutemen were firing at redcoats, and British muskets were opening a volley against the assembled patriots. So, quick question. Was it known at the time as the shot that was heard around the world, or did this come about later? No, it was the term was coined by Ralph Waldo Emerson in a poem he wrote in 19, or 1837. So, this was like an after-the-fact kind of thing. They didn't really, at the time, call it that. Right. Okay, that's interesting. I always kind of thought it was like, well, it may not have been called that at the time, but like everyone thought of it as that, like, oh, everyone knew about that, blah, blah, blah. And they just kind of put the name to it later. The reason that they called it the shot heard around the world was because they considered it to be the first shot of what a concept that came to be called the Atlantic Revolutions. I've never heard of that. It's a it's a concept in history. It's it, it it has its it's it's complicated. It has its merits. It has its drawbacks, but it's the idea of understanding the the revolutions of the late seventeen hundreds as happening in relation to one another through uh through interconnection by via the Atlantic Ocean. So the the big main that's kind of a stretch in my opinion, but like I can understand why all of those revolutions that happened happen is because you're expecting a satellite nation that you control to appear to your rules when you're not there to understand the plight of the man from there. Well, it wasn't just the west side of the Atlantic. It was also referring to the east side. So specifically like the French Revolution. So there was the idea is that there's like this interconnectedness of ideas. And then once revolution started in like the United States, then the ideas of that revolution put into practice there, therefore influenced revolutions in other places. So like the American revolution launched off that inspired a lot of revolutionary thought in France, the revolution in France launched off that inspired a lot of revolutionary thought in Haiti. Um, the re the experiences of all of those revolutions there then inspired even more revolutions in like South America, and it just it happened all over the like, that that's the idea. It's the snowball effect, but that that doesn't mean that just because one happened doesn't mean the other wouldn't have happened eventually. No, it wouldn't. It, yeah, that's not what it's saying. It's just like it it it's trying to connect the trend of revolutions in the late 17 and early 1800s back to an interconnection of like the trans, like the Atlantic triangle of trade, like between like the Americas and Europe and Africa and how it all interconnected. And it, it's, it's a thing. It's a lot more complicated than that. But anyways, I think it's kind of a folly idea to try and connect them because like the way that the colonies, specifically colony rebellion, happened is because I feel like a lot of the the governing um, body or like country wasn't involved enough to take care of the issues that uh, that were actually plaguing the people in the area, and it was an inevitable situation in my opinion well the idea that all of the revolutions were interconnected at least like ideologically and even like through like even in a lot of cases like the people involved um and that they had like interconnected reasons for 
having revolutions. In my opinion, from what I know of the of the era, that is not even up for debate. The fact that they are all interconnected. There's a reason that they all happened around the same time. Uh, that that it's because it's completely unprecedented. A complete not just a changing of government, but a complete ideological shift in the way that entire civilizations think that motivated mass changes in government and the overthrow of centuries old institutions that they all have the idea that they all happen separately for completely separate reasons, all within less than a century is completely absurd in my mind. Agreed. Anyways. So uh, where were we? I, I found where we were. Yeah. Yeah. So nobody knows who fired the shot heard around the world. Um, but soon Minutemen were firing at Redcoats and British muskets were opened a volley against the assembled patriots. When the shooting ceased, eight Americans were dead. No British were dead. Although one British soldier was wounded and the commander of this detachment, Captain uh, John Picard, his horse was killed from under him. Those were the only two living things that were shot on the British side were one soldier and the commander's horse. <laughs> so, um, but the British ended up not finding the militia stockpile there. The Sons of Liberty had already moved it. So the British troops continued on to Concord, where it was rumored that Samuel Adams and John Hancock were hiding. But when they arrived at the North Bridge leading into town, the Old North Bridge, they encountered unexpectedly stiff resistance. Hundreds of militiamen from all over the area were now swarming in to reinforce Concord. And the overwhelming firepower coming from the other side of the stream over the bridge forced the British to retreat back to Boston. They never entered Concord. Nice. On their long retreat back to Boston, the Redcoats found themselves harassed and picked off by crack shots from the Massachusetts militia who would hop out of the forest for long enough to get a shot off and then they retreat before the soldiers could react. Good old-fashioned guerrilla tactics. Oh, yeah. By the end of the ordeal, 49 Americans and 73 British troops were dead. And the American Revolution had begun. A long overdue in this story, to be honest. It feels, the way you first described it, I know me making assumptions based on like a brief description isn't the greatest. I thought a lot of his story would take place at like the beginning of the revolution to like during the revolution, you know, there is as far as like war and action goes, there's only about 12 years of his life. He lives until he's in his sixties, but there's only about 12 years in his life that actually have a lot of action. And most of that is not during the American revolution. And that is very confusing because of how important he was in the revolution. And I promise I'll explain, (laughs) even though a lot of that explanation will be in the next episode and I don't want to spoil anything. But Ethan received news of the battles of Lexington and Concord just a few days after that happened. Or I'm sorry, Ethan received the news of the battles of Lexington and Concord just a few days after they happened and was just as outraged as the rest of the colonies were. He was very upset about it. He was very angry. But his anger very quickly turned into excitement because he quickly realized that the Green Mountain Boys... Well, two things about the Green Mountain Boys. The first thing, at that moment, they are the second largest military force on the continent, right behind the British Army. Holy crap. How many mountain boys were there? 2,000. Holy crap. That's a lot more than I expected. I thought there would be a couple hundred at max. There are about 88, either 83 or 8,800 settlers in what would become Vermont. And of those, about 2,000 of them are in the militia. That's, That's bonkers. And on top of that, They've also been fighting with New York for the last four years. Yeah. 
or five years. So not only are they some of, not only are they the second largest military force on the continent, they are also some of the most veteran troops in all of the colonies. The only the only soldiers more veteran than them are like forty or fifty year old guys from that fought in the French and Indian War. Interesting. The second thing that he realized was that the the New Hampshire grants were located right next to one of the most important strategically important positions in all of the colonies. So the Green Mountain Boys started to draft what seemed at the time like one of the most insane and suicidal ideas possible. This ragtag group of outlaw farmers were going to capture Fort Ticonderoga, the largest fortification in all of British America. That is their plan. That's insane. They heard that the war had started and they went full fucking hog into it. You're damn right they did. <laughs> uh, this, this shit slaps. This is rad as hell. Mm. So they got their idea. They got like a, a general plan set up for what they were going to do, which I'll explain in a minute. The first thing they wanted to do is they wanted to shoot off the idea to the Connecticut Committee of Correspondence. So I'll explain. I'll explain something real quick. At this time, every almost every colony had set up what was called the committee of correspondence. These committees of correspondence kind of acted as like a rebel government out from underneath the actual government governments of each colonies and their primary purpose. So quick derailment on that. When the revolution broke out, did each colony's government still kind of try and fall in line with the crown or did they completely rebel at the same time as the revolution? Um, at this point, at this point, the it really depended because the governments, the actual governments, like the colonial assemblies, were kind of under the thumb of the British administration at this point. So even if they did. I'm talking about the governments that were in the colonies themselves. Yeah, these the official governments, like the the assemblies, were still under like crown appointed governors and were under the thumb of like military, uh, uh, military. Um, oh, what's the word? They had the military nearby, so they weren't going to do anything rash, even if they sympathized with the revolution. And so they started. Uh, the patriots started forming like these alternative governments outside of the official crown governments. And a lot of these took the forms of committees of correspondence. Um, and so did, were any of the old official quote unquote governments eventually rebel or did they just kind of like force them out and with the revolution and throw it away just like they did the crown? Um, a lot of them would actually come along and join the revolution. Um, uh, I Okay. That's kind of the way I understood it, but I was wanting clarification because that was an assumption from my history lessons, not like an explicit thing. I don't know specifics, but um, I don't know the specifics of like what happened to which colonies um, or what, like how their government shook out. But I do know that there were there was continuity in most colonies between the old colonial governments and the new uh, state governments. So there was some continuity. Okay. Uh, it's just that at this moment, most of the revolution is being coordinated by these unofficial governments and the committees of correspondence who are reporting information from each state, each colony to the Continental Congress which is the central authority of the revolution. That makes sense. So they shot their idea off to the Connecticut Committee of Correspondence for permission to launch the attack. They wanted that permission from the Committee of Correspondence so that they'd have the blessing of like a recognized revolutionary government. And they received their permission on April 30th. Fast forward a little bit. The afternoon of May 9th, 
about a hundred Green Mountain boys assembled alongside. What year again? 1775. So it's the afternoon, May 9th. About a hundred Green Mountain boys assembled alongside another hundred militiamen that Ethan had recruited from Connecticut and Massachusetts. I don't know why they're there. They had a lot of Green Mountain boys already, but uh, they wanted to. You're telling me. They wanted to come along. So they prepared to assemble boats, which they would use to cross Lake Champlain and reach the fort, which I hadn't mentioned this, but the fort. Yeah, the, the fort that they're going after, Fort Ticonderoga, is along the shores of Lake Champlain or Lake Champlain, but on the west side, on the New York side. So they have to cross the lake to get over to it. Yeah. And the only reason I know about Lake Champlain is because they have their quote unquote claim to fame for their version of Nessie champ, which is probably a load of bull hockey. Yeah, that sounds like something Vermonters would come up with. Well, everything I've seen about like Nessie like creatures, like none of the evidence seems to like substantiate to anything credible to be perfectly honest like i am someone who definitely want wants to believe in a lot of supernatural and like um cryptid stuff i'm just not given enough to like factually want to say yeah i bet you that's out there yeah that's that's the thing is i think cryptids are really neat and i love to learn about them i just don't think they're real (laughs) They're just they're just not real. I feel like I feel like there is definitely animals out there that could be tied to cryptid experiences that are one hundred percent scientifically explainable. We're just taking a ass backwards look on them. Like it's just like the um a chupacabra is most definitely just like a coyote or something with mange, and that's what started the chupacabra rumor. It, stuff like that and i definitely wish like supernatural stuff is real but like i've been given no no reason to actually give faith that it is you know yeah bigfoot started out as uh back in the 1800s it was sightings of bears that were starving and so they looked kind of skeletal and so they looked a little bit more va- like they had vaguely human figures and so when they stood on their hind legs they kind of looked like people I thought uh, it started off because they saw, like, I don't know if shaved is the right word, but, like, either mangy or shaved circus bears that got, like, just dumped because they weren't looking healthy anymore. That's what I thought Bigfoot started off as. Yeah, I've heard a few different theories about, like, where Bigfoot started from. Uh, But they all started in, like, the 1800 with, like, bears with something wrong with them. Basically. So they look vaguely more humanid, humanoid. And then fast forward to like the 1970s and you've got guys in cheap outfits uh, appearing in gray, grainy, faked videos. Oh, I guarantee a lot of the modern stuff on Bigfoot and such is fake as I'll get out. Oh, they're all fake. <laughs> they're all fake as fuck. I, I mean, like it's produced to make um, sensational headlines. Not that it's not bigfoot because like none of the claimed bigfoot stuff would or even feels close to the creature that they're claiming it could be man it sucks that our drunken minds can't do anything funny like like tell fart jokes we just go off on these random tangents for like an hour while we're trying to finish the podcast we have intellectual discussions while drunk Derek. we're never normal yeah, oh, why well, I, I should have known that. That's the basis of our whole podcast. What the fuck? <laughs> Anyways. So, an hour before the attack was set to launch, a genteel-looking gentleman in a perfect, pristine crimson military uniform rode up and approached the gathering of the of militia. He was joined shortly after by about 100 militia of his own. The man approached the Green Mountain Boys, asked to speak to their commander. Ethan stepped up and introduced himself, and the man greeted him back, introducing himself as Benedict Arnold. 
So we finally got there. Benedict's finally in the story. As it turns out, Benedict had had the exact same idea as Ethan and had received permission from the Massachusetts Committee of Correspondence to launch an expedition to capture Fort Ticonderoga as well. They had happened to arrive at exactly the same time. Is this where their rivalry starts? Yeah. Almost immediately. Sounds about white. Benedict, despite his posh demeanor, or... Can we take a second to sound how absolutely pompously white Benedict is for a name? It, it sounds like you were born with, like, a stick up your ass if you're named Benedict. Yeah. And Benedict is a pompous elitist asshole, but... He has his likable moments, and that's what I hate about him. You hate that he has some likable moments. Yeah, like, for one thing, he really did get fucked over by the Continental Army and the Continental Congress, and by Ethan Allen. He genuinely got fucked over. Um, And also, he had a very tragic upbringing, so it's really hard to hold some of his personality flaws against him. Like... His mother died when he was young. His father was a raging alcoholic and the embarrassment of the entire town. And he always had a chip on his shoulder about like appearing as like he was always trying to please people. And it got to the point where he was so unable to please people in the Continental Army that he decided to go give the British Army a try instead. And then he couldn't please anybody in the British Army because Nobody likes a turncoat. No. And so he lived the rest of his life being hated by everybody. See, that's the thing about betraying another person for another team. Even if, like, the person you're you're betraying for at the time has absolute faith in you, there's no way that lasts long term. Because, like, oh, eventually they betrayed this one person. Who knows if You've proven you're not 100% loyal to any cause. Yeah, they've you you've already Yeah, you've already established that you there is something that can make you turn to the other side. So there's no guarantee that you'll stay loyal. So there's no way that they can full, ever fully trust you. And that's exactly what happened with Benedict after after his tragic life. But anyways, so Despite his posh demeanor, or maybe in part because of it, he immediately started making enemies. No, duh. He declared... Oh, yeah. He declared that his expedition was the legal one, and that if the Green Mountain Boys wanted to join him, that they would be under his command. The boys immediately started reaching for their muskets. Many of them told him in no uncertain terms that they will recognize no commander but Ethan Allen. Of loyal boys? There was no way in hell that they were ever going to be under the command of Benedict Arnold. To defuse the situation, Ethan pulled Benedict aside and hammered out a deal with him. We have no idea what they said in this discussion, but one of two things happened. Either they agreed to joint command for the attack where Ethan would or where Benedict would control any troops from Massachusetts and Ethan would uh, command all the other troops, including the Green Mountain Boys. Or Ethan made it clear both with with his intimidating size because he was a full head taller than Benedict and by his commanding presence and his effective speaking skills that Benedict was only along for the ride I bet you it was more like, oh, you're just here for the ride thing. Because like, I don't see Ethan Allen conceding to just this pompous asshole from what I've heard about him. Yeah, I'm sure it was a mixture of both. I'm sure it was like, you're never going to be in command of me, but I'll throw you a bone and let you command the Massachusetts militia. I kind of more see it like, I'll make you think you're commanding kind of thing. Like, Sure, you can give some orders, but you're not really in charge kind of thing. Yeah. Well, for what it's worth, during the raid, Benedict does do a pretty good job and is an effective leader. So for what that's worth. um, I'm sure Benedict was actually a pretty good 
leader if the British took him on. It's just they didn't he wasn't properly utilized and he felt slighted is why he went to the British is what I always assumed. Yep, that is exactly what happened. He was one of the most effective and most successful generals in the Continental Army. He was a completely invaluable asset to the Patriot cause. And because they couldn't keep fucking him over on pay, and because nobody liked him except for George Washington, he decided that he'd try his luck with people who might like him in Britain. And uh, that didn't work out either. So anyway, I keep talking about his backstory. We're not, I mean, we just introduced, or we're, we keep talking about what happens after the fact. And I just introduced him. It's so anyways, uh, either way, Benedict never held command over Ethan Allen. The attack was supposed to be at around 1130 on the night of May 9th. But the boats that they had ordered didn't arrive until 1.30 a.m. And by the time that they set the boats off, a storm had rolled in and was whipping up harsh waves on the lake. It took so much longer than anticipated to cross the stormy water that they only had time to cross 83 men. They had almost 300, and they could only get 83 across. God dang, talk about a literal bottleneck. Um, so they could only cross 83 men if they wanted to begin the assault before sunrise. So just before summer, sunrise, the 83 men reached the fort's entrance gate. Now, I said before that it was like the largest fortification in British America, which is true. But at this point, the fort was a shadow of what it once was, Fort Ticonderoga. It was just a few decades before that before then the site of one of the most important engagements in the french and indian war and at the time it was originally at the time of the battle during the french and indian war it was actually incomplete since then the british had fully built it but then they just left it and left it to fall apart how come just because it was expensive and it was on a frontier that didn't have a lot of action and they didn't really have a need to give it a big garrison anymore because there weren't French people around anymore. Did they not have the sunk cost fallacy back then, or did it not have the same weight it does now? Well, sunk sunk cost fa fallacy doesn't always hold up to the reality of the millions of dollars in, or the billions of dollars in debt that you have, that your government has. Tell that to a current America. If you've got this big ass fort that's going to cost a million pounds a year to take care of, and it serves absolutely no purpose because the people it was built to keep out were literally you before you conquered the people who built it. Again, tell that to current American military. <laughs> well, that's different. They've got jobs waiting for them after they retire from the military. That's why they keep spending so much money for these contractors. It's completely different. I don't know what you're talking about. Sure it is. Fuck you. Support the troops. Anyways. But yeah, so at this point, it was poorly garrisoned. It only had 48 troops stationed there, which means that even though um, even though Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold could only get about a third of their troops across, they still outnumbered the fort garrison. <laughs> and then um, parts of the walls were falling apart, too. Uh, the gate uh, couldn't lock anymore. They just didn't lock. They left it in disrepair. Yeah, they left it in disrepair. I think this is the funniest part. At some point between the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War, they lost the keys to the front gate. And so they just <laughs> they just didn't lock it anymore. <laughs> and on top of that, all of the troops stationed there had no reason to believe that they were going to be attacked because they hadn't heard about the battles of Lexington and Concord. And they had no idea that they were now at war. This was two months after it happened. <laughs> Technology is rad. It is quite lovely. Ethan gave the command to advance on the gate at 4 a.m. Using a predetermined setup, a predetermined signal, which was three owl hoots. So he gave three owl hoots and they all got up and rushed. How do you give three owl hoots? You know the thing you can like cup your hand around your other hand and like. I would assume that wouldn't travel well enough though. Were they commanded to like echo it off or something? 
it it traveled well enough for everybody of this tiny little group of like 80 guys to hear i guess um so yeah three owl hoots and with that the very first offensive military action in the history of the united states was launched the very first one Um, so benedict and ethan are at the very front of this entire group they rush right up to the gate they throw the gate door open according to eyewitnesses benedict was the first to reach the gate because he was smaller and could run faster they scared the shit out of the sentry who had who was waiting right behind the front gate who had been asleep they startled that soldier awake he tried to fire his musket at benedict and ethan but his powder was wet from the rain and it misfired. So he threw it down and he started running back deeper into the fort, running towards the barracks, yelling that there were intruders inside. As one does. Benedict and Ethan started fighting off a couple more sentries. One of those sentries, Ethan captured by slashing the side of his head open with his saber, which is, you know, cool. Uh, But he captured the guy, and the guy led him to the officer's quarters so that he could go and talk. You know, have a nice little friendly chat with the commandant of the fort. While that was happening, Benedict was leading some men to capture the the barracks and all of the enlisted men who were sleeping there. As one does. As one does. There's, there was an... So Ethan is heading into, and all of the officers live in like a single house. And so as he's coming into this, as Ethan is coming into this house, an artillery lieutenant tries to stop him on the stairs. And he asks, by whose authority do you enter his majesty's fort? Now, according to Ethan's side of the story, which he wrote in his memoirs a few years later, Ethan responded, in the name of great Jehovah and the Continental Congress. One of the other Green Mountain boys, who was just behind him on the stairs, reported that what he actually did was ignore the lieutenant and his question, and he yelled up towards the commandant's room, Come out of there, you goddamn old rat! (laughs) A quick question. How much weight did the name of the Continental Congress carry at this time? Um, Well, it was the... Everybody was kind of vaguely aware that it was the center of uh, the rebellion. And it was like the ideological and uh, administrative center of the revolution in the colonies. So it held enough weight in like, these are the guys who are in charge of the rebels. So. Okay. Uh, I should have brought them up earlier. Uh, but yeah, like right after... The first Continental Congress came up right after the passing of the Intolerable Acts. So right after the uh, the Boston Tea Party, when Boston was put under martial law. So that's when the first Continental Congress came up. And then right after Lexington and Concord was when the second Continental Congress appeared. And that's the one that's in charge of the revolution now. I didn't realize there were I, I mean, logically, it makes sense. There were two different Continental Congresses. More than one Continental Congress, let me specify. I just never really thought about it. So the Commandant, he took a while to get to the door because he wanted to get dressed first. Understandable. (laughs) His fort's under attack, and he wants to make sure he doesn't answer the door in his underwear. (laughs) I have no shame. If you... If you, in the middle of the night, Knock on my door. I'm probably going to, like, answer in my skivvies. I might have a shirt on. I might not. But, like, that's your fault for in the middle of the night knocking on my door. <laughs> yeah. By the way, the the artillery lieutenant who stopped Ethan and asked him by whose authority, um, at the time, he was, on, he was wearing his officer's like his crimson coat with his officer's rank on it and had his pants in his arm. (laughs) 
power move. Put him on as you're talking to the guy. Because he hadn't gotten around to putting them on yet. <laughs> yeah, he wanted to prioritize making sure people could see his rank first. So, <laughs> oh, but yeah. So the commandant, uh, Captain William Delaplace. Uh, he opens the door and asks Ethan what his terms were. Ethan said he would have the commander's immediate surrender or the commander would have instant death from his right hand. Yeah, so either you surrender, I punch you so hard you die. That's a bit cocky. Coming from a guy who's 6'2 and like 250 pounds of pure muscle. Killing someone with a single punch is very hard to pull off. Yeah, but if anybody could do it, I bet it was Ethan. <laughs> Are you doubting me? No, I know how hard it is to kill somebody with by punching them. Uh, I just think that compared to the nutrition that the level of nutrition that the, the officers in Fort Ticonderoga were probably getting, which probably wasn't great. They were probably some scrawny guys. Oh, you're saying they were frail. Yeah, they were probably frail because even though this guy's a captain, which means he's probably about 30, I'm imagining him as like an 80 year old man. So <laughs> I mean, probably compared to our current 80 year olds. Yeah. 30 year olds were basically 80 year olds back then. <laughs> well, I mean, they didn't get the right nutrition. They probably didn't get the, they probably got worked way harder, like compared to their nutritional development. So, so when presented with the offer, Captain Delaplace immediately surrendered his saber and his pistol over to Ethan and with it, Fort Ticonderoga. Less than two months after Lexington and Concord, an American force had captured the crown jewel of the British colonial army with a without a single death. Nobody died. Uh, one person was injured on each side. On the British side, it was the guy that Ethan had cut with his saber. And on the Green Mountain Boys, it was just one guy who got like his arm cut by a bayonet. And other than that, nobody was hurt. It was almost a completely bloodless uh, fight. The following day, Seth Warner took a smaller group of Green Mountain Boys north and captured a second British fort at Crown Point, which that fort was only garrisoned by nine guys. So those were two of the most strategically important, uh, two of the most strategically important forts in all of the northern colonies. And they'd go down just like that. So at one fell swoop, Ethan Allen was elevated from the leader of a backcountry rebellion to the first hero of the American Revolution. He was the first revolutionary hero, huh? The first hero of the American Revolutionary War. That's crazy. Yeah. I think I've touched on this, but it's it's crazy how we can have, quote unquote, lost founding fathers and like never even hear about what they did and their contributions with the way we kind of like go over American history. Because like even my college classes even if they went into more detail, they covered it in the same way. They they glossed over the same bits. They generalized the same way, at least from what I remember. Again, history was not my subject, but that doesn't mean I floundered in it. Like, I didn't pay attention or anything. Honestly, like, this is just such... There's a lot of stuff to learn from Ethan Allen's story. It's a good example of how much we really don't know about the founding of our country. We like to think we know the good broad points of our founding of our country, but we're missing a lot of contextual details that like makes it make sense. It it explains a whole lot more. Yeah. Just, just in the story of Ethan Allen, We've learned about the role of religion in pre-colonial America and in the development of the American Revolution. We've learned about some of the like the finances and the land speculation that was dominating the economy that eventually itself developed into economic motivations for the Revolutionary War. And we've learned about the the military history of the first like 
the insane explosiveness of the first few months of the American Revolutionary War and how it eventually spiraled into what it became. Definitely. Like and those 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 are very, very important things to know for the context of understanding the American Revolution that doesn't even come up vaguely, it's just completely absent. I feel like Ethan Allen would have been a great historical figure that <sighs> Again, he's not really a founding father, but he still feels like a lost founding father that we should have learned about in class because it would really set a lot of groundwork that we didn't I didn't get in my history of the American Revolution that would really like set the scene of why we rebelled like for the until I was like in late high school when I actually started like look a little bit into revolutionary war history and again when i was younger it had i had absolutely no interest in it i was just vaguely aware of it but as i looked into it even just the tiniest bit i realized hang on there's an entire year of the revolutionary war before the declaration of independence even becomes an idea what i wasn't i i struggle with linear time on uh like things i like this i didn't realize that yeah the war started in march of 1775 the declaration of independence was signed in july of 1776 that is over a year that really shows you how like misleading our history lessons are it the way i was taught it and again this is probably misrememberings plus a really crappy school that before any revolutionary stuff happened, we did the Declaration of Independence. We said, no, screw you. We're going to be our own nation. Then we backed it up with the revolution. Right. Yeah, that's that's how I understood it. When I was younger was like. Like this, the bad taxes happened. Lexington and Concord happened that motivated independence. And then the war came after independence. I didn't I didn't realize that there was like when the war started, they were still calling themselves English. That kind of makes sense in context, though, because you're not going to right away identify with a new sense of nationality, like right out the gate, even if you're like spearheading the movement. Yeah. And it wasn't until. Because originally they wanted, I'll get into this more in the next episode, but originally after the fighting started, especially after the Battle of Bunker Hill, um, they wanted to extend an offer of peace to the crown with just a list of like minor reforms that they could do, including the repealing of some taxes, not even all of the taxes, just some of them. It was called the Olive Branch Petition. And the king responded back to the olive branch petition, which was offering peace at some very reasonable rates. And he responded back saying, "Um, just, uh, just give up your rebellion now. And I won't have you all drawn and quartered more or less. It was more diplomatic than that. That's basically what I said. So King George wasn't even going to like contemplate that, Hey, there's some strife. He didn't even have to admit he was wrong. He just like, maybe they're looking at it from a different angle, even if they're wrong. He refused to even see it that way. Right. Yeah. And it's, and so it was the response to the olive branch petition. That is what finally convinced the majority of the continental Congress to seriously entertain the idea of independence, because if they didn't, and they lost the war. Or even if they won the war and they stayed part of Britain, they were all going to die. They were all going to be shipped off to London and be publicly hanged, castrated, drawn and quartered, which is what you did to which is what Britain did to rebels. I I didn't even hear about the Olive Branch petition in like I it may have been briefly brought up, but like 
that rings no bells in my history lessons. Like, I didn't even know that was a thing that they were like, oh, maybe we can end this before it really gets bad or however that timeline worked out. Yeah. And so when they got the response back, they realized, oh, God, if we don't win this, we're all going to die. And so that's when that's when independence became the priority. And I can't really blame them. Yeah, no, that's what that was the logic is the law of self-preservation in action. So, but it's it gets to something else that I'd like to explore a lot more with this podcast in regards to revolutionary history. So all different kinds of revolutions from the United States to France to Haiti to Russia to Mexico to South America, all over the place. The main thing there, there's a few things. There are three things that you need for a revolution to happen. Successful, successful of a revolution or failure. Doesn't matter. For it to start in the first place, you need three things. One, a population that has major discontent and disillusionment with the existing system. Two, the necessary ideas floating around for an alternative system to what currently exists. And three, an instigating spark. So in the United States, you had the discontent, which was unfair taxation without representation within political, within the political system. You had the alternate ideas, which was the enlightenment and the ideals of republicanism and representative democracy. And you had the inciting event, which was Lexington and Concord. That's it. That's what you need. That's what you need for a revolution to start. And that's something I'd like to explore a lot. Like, uh, like uh, Russia, Russian Revolution. Um, discontent was frustration at the economic downturn caused and the mass death caused by the First World War and the complete inability of uh, the czar and the rest of the political system to respond effectively to it. The alternative ideas were socialism, communism, and anarchism. And the inciting event was the bread riots in Petrograd in February 1917. It's the same framework you see over and over again, and it's all dependent on a government which is completely incapable of understanding what is their own problem (laughs) and why people are doing the things that they are because they're so full of themselves and so drunk on their own power that they can't possibly comprehend that they're wrong. Yeah, like it baffles my mind that people can be so confident and like so assured of their position that they can't even conceive that a notion of being wrong like my anxiety like i'm sure a lot of people who struggle with anxiety makes me at least question if i made the right choice at that time even if like i am confident i picked the right path like even if there's like oh even if he picked wrong, there's no way it really ends badly. I think of how it could have ended badly. Yeah, and it's and like imagine like those very human emotions, those very human anxieties and flaws, and just ideas about yourself, and magnify them to the scale of entire national legal systems. And that's why monarchies are bad. Agreed. Like. I also I also think like the idea that one person can like properly manage like an entire governmental structure that manages like uh an entire country is folly. You need multiple layers if you have a system in which there is like a countrywide system to be able to like make sure something like that doesn't happen because there are going to people be going to be people that are just so self-assured that they don't even question that if they're doing the right thing and then just go off the rails. Yeah. And that, that self-assuredness is one of the most that, that really is, it's a flaw that's kind of inherent to a lot of like the human character, just the human experience but it is amplified so much by the position by being in a position of power like if you're a monarch or a prime minister and it because you can get the sense you can trick yourself into thinking you're always right because you always have the like the machinations of national power at your 
You have the power of the state at your back, you know, regardless of what your choice is. And so you get to thinking that, well, I always get my way, so I must always be right. There's no repercussions for being wrong, so I'm always right. That's what happens. Yeah, and then and then revolutions happen and they realize there are still repercussions. There's no repercussions in the current system that I have to worry about, so I don't worry about repercussions in general because our system cannot fail. Yeah, and that's another thing is like that's a big part of revolutions is that the leaders who are in power become so convinced of the permanence of their own position that they will bend over backwards in just the most insane mind-boggling mental gymnastics to try and trick themselves into believing that the way that things are right now where they're in a position of power is perfectly permanent and that everything will eventually correct itself which is absolutely horse cocky because like nothing stays the same in anything like even if you want to say stay the same is like your lineage takes over or your quote unquote spiritual lineage if it's not like a direct biological successor it's your ideological successor things change over time no matter who you are it nothing is permanent like even stories are not permanent. Things get edited over time. Things get changed. It, it And you'd think that a king of England, only about a little over a century removed from the English Revolution, would understand that nothing is permanent. But no, George, this, this king, George the Third, yeah, George the Third, um, was just... And and also his parliament, the the Tories in parliament were completely incapable of understanding that that well, maybe this new system, maybe this new system that these that these revolutionaries in America are advocating might have a chance to actually work. They didn't even entertain that e- even as an aspect of like, well, how do we understand it so that we can stop it? It never even occurred to them that it could work, that it could function and survive on its own separate from the mother country, because they never saw they never saw the revolutionaries as being like like independent, intelligent actors in their own right. They saw them as children needing to be disciplined. And it, it all of all of these paternalistic and the the deluding themselves into believing that society is static and the complete inability to to comprehend like other people's problems is all of the factors that go into a a government that builds a revolution against itself and that that's how revolution happens so i'm looking up right now how old he was in 1774 or was it 5 that the shot heard around uh, the world happened. I think it was five. Um, because like, okay, so he was thirty. He was thirty-seven. It baffles my mind that he had no doubts in his rule that he ruled that he doubted the revolution the way he did. Doubted that the revolution could take off the way it did. It just, it's crazy. Like. Even if it was like my irrational side of my brain, I would have still had like plans for in case the revolution was doing better than I planned. You know, man, if you think. If you think that, like. If you can imagine, like how he must have felt in 1781. Or 1783, when the Revolutionary War ended and the surrender at Yorktown happened and America won its independence. Imagine how he felt then. Imagine how much more fucking freaked out he must have felt when the French Revolution started. Oh, man, that must... I I mean, yeah. No wonder he had mental illness. I mean, holy shit. I... That's one thing I will say here and now. I guarantee mental illness is all... Even today, but let's say even back... So, mostly back then 
mental illness is a lot more prevalent than we would like to think because quote unquote average slash normal thought isn't the majority. It's the average. Not everyone falls into the average because the average takes those who are above and those who are below and makes it what's in between. And it's just crazy to think people believe that mental illness didn't exist 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It it's a load of hooey. We we just didn't see the signs back then. We didn't know how to recognize it. Back then they just called it mania and they or lunacy and they just like throw you out into a field and let you just wander around for the rest of your short miserable life. Was well, because they didn't really care to learn or like work with people back then. If you don't benefit me, I don't care. You're cast out. That's how it went. Well, got any last minute thoughts on Ethan Allen and his story so far? It's mind boggling. He's not at least brought up in some significant manner in our history lessons of the American Revolution because he played a significant role a, b- a bit short uh, time-wise in the American Revolution. It's it's crazy. Even when he's not directly involved in the actual war itself, he's still having a huge effect on it, as you're going to see coming up. I don't know if the lost founding father is the right term. Maybe the silent founding father? Yeah, yeah, the silent founding father is like, uh, I think Thomas Young would fall into that too. Um, Thomas Young, Thomas Paine. That needs to be like a long-term project for us where we have like a group of them where it's the silent founding fathers where we go over uh, people who influenced the Revolutionary War even if they weren't considered a founding father. Yeah, I can think of a few different guys like that. I guess... Thomas Paine wouldn't really count because they do like talk a lot about common sense. That's the end of it. They just talk about common sense. He, he the way you're bringing him up, he he played more than just that role, right? Oh yeah, he was um he was pretty much like the ideological leader of the most radical factions of the founding fathers, like all the most radical people. He was like their like their ideological uh, messenger, basically. Um, And he also had a long, like he had a long revolutionary career after the American revolution. He went to France and he was part of the French revolution too. Like he was a fairly important figure, like for the development of very, very radical thought. Like he was, um, He was basically like a social democrat before social democrats exist. He was insanely progressive for his time. That doesn't surprise me. Like, I'm sure there's a lot of quote unquote proto ideals that we have today that really didn't get recorded in history. Yeah. Like, like he was writing, Thomas Paine was writing about um, like a universal basic income in the 1770s. For real? I didn't know that was an idea even back then. Yeah, he was a staunch abolitionist. He once told a gr- a room full of slave owners during a party in Virginia that that were that were all worried about the Haitian Revolution. He told them all to their faces, "Yeah, if your if your slaves revolt and murder you all, you all had it coming." They did, for the record. They did. He was one hundred percent right. Um. He, I can't, I don't know if he supported women's suffrage, but he definitely supported like women's property rights and an extension of women's inclusion in like the economy and women's individual like autonomy. It didn't necessarily have to be suffrage at the time because I think suffrage was a 1900s thing, but like I, f- I feel like he was behind the ideas of women's suffrage at the very least. Yeah, he was ahead of the curve on women's rights, definitely. Um, but yeah, like we we 
we know him for common sense because common sense was the popular thing that a lot that motivated a lot of Americans to get involved in the revolution. We don't talk about the it was the palatable idea that wasn't controversial to the narrative they wanted to spin. Right. We don't include all of the social progressivism that was an intricate part of Thomas Paine's beliefs because social progressivism doesn't fit the narrative that because because like the narrative is that yeah people used to have pretty regressive beliefs but we're better now and then you actually look back and like no a lot of people had these exact same beliefs back then but just like today they don't have any political power or political pull because all of you assholes are in charge so the brown people are in charge and we need to fix that is what you're saying well that's one way of interpreting it I've got a very different way of interpreting it that might that will get me put on an FBI watch list. But Derek, you're fooling yourself if you don't think both of us are not on some kind of FBI watch list right now. Well, I believe I can believe you're on an NSA watch list just so they can watch your porn history. But Derek, you spout a lot of subversive American shit posts on your Twitter, and I was in a course. That put me on the track for criminal justice. We're both on an FBI watch list. Whether we're on a good or bad one is a whole well, different story. I'll see you in hell. I'll make sure there's room for the rest of our government. You got, you got a, you got a Twitter that you want to plug. They can find me at Tim, aka Otis, on Twitter. And then, where can they find you, Derek? Um, they can find me on on Twitter at Visigoth. The I is a one, the O is a zero. Uh, you can also find me on Facebook and Instagram. However, if you do that, I will block you, you fucking freaks. You can also find the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at the Alexander Society Pod and on Twitter at Alex Society Pod. Oh, yeah. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review on your favorite streaming service. Bye.